In January 6, 2021, the U.S. Department of Labor published a 1,200-page final ruling to help clarify whether workers are independent contractors or employees. Now, the purpose of this final ruling was intended to reduce litigation, provide additional job satisfaction to workers, and potentially to reduce the amount of misclassified workers. Well, it's fairly a confusing topic, and it's definitely not black and white. But today, we're going to provide you, the business owner, with a cliff notes version that's going to help you navigate this complex final ruling. There's three main points that are the heart of this final ruling that we're going to be reviewing today. The first is the economic reality test, and it determines whether the individual has an independent business or whether they are really dependent on the hiring company. And there's two main points that are really examined, or actually three. The first is whether the hiring company has control over the worker. Now that comes in many different flavors, and it's more subjective than objective. But for instance, if you require that worker to report to you, the company, or you have them wear your T-shirt and uh, with your logo, company's logo on it, and they hand out your company's business cards, that's a form of control. The second factor that we're really looking at is whether the worker has an opportunity to make a profit and also lose money. And that's a factor that's commonly overlooked. So if you hire someone to do a job as a contractor, and they don't do a good job and they cause damages, then as a contractor, you could sue them or you could require them to redo the work and it would be an out-of-pocket expense for the contractor. But if that worker was an employee, you would simply fire them or reprimand them. The third important point is really to focus on why is that contractor being paid? What is the essence of what they're being paid for? They're being paid primarily for their services or they're being paid for their services plus their tools, equipment, certification, and skill. Focusing and understanding what is the point of the payment is very helpful to determine the classification. The third and important point that the DOL focuses on, and it says if, if the other two factors are really not clear enough, then let's go into three additional factors. And those three additional factors are what skill is required to do the job. If you're hiring somebody in a low-skilled job, for instance, if they're simply just typing a letter, it doesn't require a lot of skill, a lot of tools, a lot of equipment or certification, then they might be deemed more of an employee. However, if you're hiring someone who's fairly technical, such as an architect who has CAD software and is providing tools and equipment and a lot of skill and certification to that job, they may more likely look like a contractor. Of course, there's other factors to consider. The second point that the DOL is focusing on is the permanence of the position. So is this a, a job, a contractor that you hire? Are they there on an ongoing and continuous basis and they've been doing this for five years for you very routinely? Or is this someone you hire sporadically, you know, for a couple projects here, a couple projects there? And I will tell you in the work that we do, that is something that they, they do focus on the DOL as well as the various states and the IRS. They focus on determining whether this person is a contractor. And it is a misconception, a lot of business owners, that a seasonal worker can be a contractor. Well, just because they're seasonal, but they've been doing it seasonally every year for the last 10 years, it doesn't make them a contractor. They can still be a seasonal employee. Um, the last and very important part is whether the work performed by the contractor is integrated into the core function of the company. And that has been around for a while, that factor, and it's also part of California's new ABC law. It's the B element. Does the worker perform the exact function that the company does? If you have a plumbing company that hires an independent contractor or plumber, well, they basically do the same thing, and the contractor is doing a core function of the company. But what happened if the plumbing company is really a residential plumbing company? and the plumbing contractor is a commercial contractor who specializes in restaurants. Now, that's a unique skill that the company doesn't have and it necessarily wouldn't match with the core function of the company. It is unique and it's a skill set that maybe they're hiring for a particular job. One other point that the DOL is really focusing on is they're gonna look at what's actually occurring between the relationship between the contractor and the hiring company versus what's contractually required or theoretically required. And what really that means is you might have an independent contractor agreement and you might think, great, you know what? I have a contract that says this worker is an independent contractor, therefore they must be a contractor. Well, I can tell you that that contract has really no bearing on the final determination. The DOL and the IRS and the state of California and many other states that are doing this exact analysis currently are looking at what's actually occurring. What does the relationship look like? If the contract requires the contractor to pay for any damages and, and to um, be liable for any liability that is, you know, that is caused by the contractor uh, and that they're supposed to have their own insurance, but the hiring company really never enforces that, never really requires that, then that contract is valueless. 
So what is actually occurring in reality is what's going to be focused on. I hope this has been valuable for you. This law uh, final ruling does go into effect on May 7th, 2021, 60 days after the January 6th publication. And I hope this information has been useful. I'm John Milikowski, founder of Milikowski Tax Law.